good. There's a good turnout here, Mark. I'm glad no one was uh, dissuaded by the rumors that I wouldn't show up. <laughs> <laughs> so you wrote this week, everyone Mayor Emanuel endorsed in the election came out on top. It's likely to inspire aldermen and legislators to bow down just a little bit lower in his presence, if that's physically possible. <laughs> so my question is, how did it already get to this point? We had a guy, you can understand why Daly had that power, especially in the latter half of his time in office. But Emmanuel, it seemed to be overnight. Yeah, good question. Um, you, should, you should do this you know, you think <laughs> more often, it's great. Um, first of all, I think that's a question I probably have spent my career to this point trying to answer. I'm not from Chicago, from Michigan, um, and uh, you know, obviously grew up in the sort of the shadow of Chicago and working in this profession, though it's a question, I don't understand it. But there's a mythologizing that goes on around the mayor here, where the instant you take the office, you seem to automatically, everyone is like, Mr. Mayor, Mr. Mayor, and the, pair, the, the power just goes But that right didn't happen you. with Harold Washington, didn't happen with Jane Byrne, uh, uh, to the extent that it happened well, with Daly. Daly was a- Jane Byrne was a woman, Harold Washington was an African American. That's both true. Um, you know, they, they don't call me an investigative reporter for nothing. <laughs> um, no, this guys came in. I mean, I, I, um, pretty sure there was some sort of handoff in place. I mean, he, uh, got his start in politics working for mayor Daly. Um, Bill Daly was a good friend of his. He just happened to announce a few months before mayor Daly stunned us all with his, um, the announcement of his retirement. Rahm Emanuel just happened to blurt out on a, uh, a national television show on PBS that he might someday be interested sure. in, in running for mayor. So the table, I think, was kind of set You don't for think him, Daly saw that and thought, oh, other people want he the was job, like, oh my I'll God, give it up for this them. This guy is great. Yeah. I, was, I was wondering who should come next. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Rob Emanuel, I almost forgot about him. Yeah. <laughs> that was the guy who used all his connections after he worked with me to make millions of dollars in like a year. Yeah, but here's right. something you, you have pointed out time and again online, in the paper, and that's that Daly, for all his faults, his strength was derived from knowing people in the city, from getting out into the neighborhoods, from forming alliances, for better or for worse, with different neighborhood groups. Whereas Emanuel seems to have accumulated very quickly all of this power without necessarily doing that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, first of all, Daly did grow up a prince. He essentially was the closest thing we have in Chicago to um, you know, growing up in a royal family. So he did know everybody. I mean, even as a young man, um, great clips for those of you guys, history buffs, the 1968, the infamous 1968 Democratic Convention. We all know what happened in the streets, but um, what's great is to see some of those clips of Richard J. Daly's you know, advisors and allies in there shouting what they later claimed, of course, was faker, faker, which we know it wasn't faker, faker. Um, but one of them is, uh, is Richie. And at the time, he was known um, in some quarters as Dirty Little Richie. That was his nickname. Uh, he did not have a great reputation. He was not seen as a particularly intellectual guy. He's, um, the, he's, the, he's, he's I'm going to quote, I'm going to reference Shakespeare right now. He's like Prince Hal. That's right. Yeah, thank you. That's thank you. Very well done. Very well done. Read it in 10th grade. So, but to his credit, and I certainly was among many who criticized him, particularly at the end of his reign, um, for a, you know, sort of coasting on his power and trying to move aside anyone who dared question him, or in my instance, threatened to shove a gun up his ass and shoot him. <laughs> well, um, tell that story. Tell that, because <laughs> that's a great one. Well, uh, tell that in Remind a second, us of all but, that time. Yeah, well, I, th just to, to finish the point, I think, yeah, he did. <laughs> no, 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 no. The gun up your ass. <laughs> gun up your ass. That's one of my proudest moments, I <laughs> would say, is, uh, um, well, this was, uh, what, I guess two, almost two years ago now. Um, as in most recently, there was a spike in shootings because the weather had gotten warm. And, uh, you know, the politicians were, various politicians were wringing their hands and saying all these things that they were doing. And Mayor Daley's thing, he has always been a passionate opponent of guns. It's a, a passionate advocate for gun control. I do think he actually believed that it made a difference, but he also 
Um, despite, don't let his stammerings and mutters and non sequiturs fool you. This guy is a genius politician. He understood that in uh, a left of center city like Chicago, especially among people who actually show up to vote and participate in politics in Chicago, that coming out every time there was a, a shooting or a spike in, in um, violence to come out and say, look, I'm going down to Springfield. I'm going to send my people to Springfield and push for tougher gun legislation. We've already got the toughest gun legislation in the country, in the city of Chicago, and yet we still have one of the highest rates of violence and, and murder by gunfire. Anyway, this is the backdrop. I had been sort of following Daly around and asking him questions at his press conferences about his uh, position on gun control and so forth. And this particular time, he was holding a press conference to talk about um, the city's response to the Supreme Court, because the Supreme Court at any day was about to rule on uh, a lawsuit challenging our gun, gun laws here. Ultimately, of course, it, it uh, essentially overturned our gun laws, but this was like, I think, a few days before. The night before this press conference, an officer, a police officer, had been shot and killed in Chatham on the south side. It was just a horrific uh, incident. Um, this guy had been a community activist, just a very sad thing. So Mayor Daley goes in there, and I, I thought, um, really to his great discredit, um, essentially used this incident uh, as, as you know, to right to transition right into politics. This is why the Supreme Court is wrong, and this is why we're pushing for tougher gun control and all this kind of thing. So, uh, you know, there are all these questions. Then they had a table set up with all these guns that Chicago police had supposedly seized off the street. I mean, it was quite an, it was quite a collection. <laughs> I mean. You know, I think e even your most... You don't uh, think that was real? You think they just picked it up at Walgreens? They, like yeah. little plastic ones? <laughs> it would have to be Walgreens in the suburbs because you can't <laughs> get them here. Um, but no, I think that there, some of these weapons were, uh, were not available over the counter. Okay. I mean, there were some pretty you. antiquated, including the one that I later became <laughs> familiar with. Um, so anyway, he, uh, I, I, at some point in the press conference, I blurted out my question and said, you know, hey, given the fact we just got done talking about all the people who were shot last night, how effective do you think our gun laws actually are? And uh, he thought about it for one second, and <laughs> about one second, that's all it took, and he just walked over to the table and he said, I'll show you how effective they are. And he picked up this uh, piece of equipment that I later was told was a, uh, a Russian semi-automatic <laughs> rifle it also happened to have a bayonet on the end wow. that was about that long. I know them. My wife's Russian. We have a few at home. <laughs> That's how they roll. I yeah. mean, you know. Um, and uh, so he picked this thing up, and the cameras are rolling and everything. And he said, I'll show you how effective it is. And Mayor Daly had a nervous giggle, still does, have a nervous giggle that's uh, strikingly close to that you hear on Beavis and Butthead. So <laughs> it was sort of like, I'll show you how effective it is. <laughs> I'll, uh, <laughs> you know shove this up your, you know, your, your, your butt and fire <laughs> off a couple rounds and then we'll see how effective you think it is. You can't, you can't blame him. The weather was nice out. The weather was yeah. really nice out. He was just in the mood. <laughs> exactly. So let's, let's talk about something a little bit more pleasant and that is weed. Yeah. You, uh, I, for years you would write about politics and then all of a sudden every fourth article, every third article, <laughs> every other article became about marijuana. <laughs> Why did this become your, your cause? What, it, what is it that is happening that you see in Chicago or that's happening elsewhere that people are doing right that we're doing wrong here? Well, I'll date myself by saying when I was a high school student in the late 80s, I wrote my first um, essay on why I thought the war on drugs was a waste of resources and why I thought drugs should be legal legalized. I was 17 years old. And it's something that I've High as hell when you wrote it. <laughs> Then I wasn't high as hell. Um, <laughs> uh, but uh, I've always thought it was a misuse of resources and that it wasn't achieving the aims that um, it supposedly was. And so more recently, I just thought, you know, I'm going to start at the very bottom of this. It's related to doing reporting on violence in Chicago and spending time in neighborhoods. I go to a lot of community policing meetings, and you see, you hear what people talk about. You see the sort of the the police officers hand out a list of all the arrests they made, and every single time it's like just off the charts. The, the top thing people are arrested for is possession of cannabis. And so and how I much just, does that cost the city every time that happens? Well, we estimated, um, went through a whole thing where we thought, I calculated it costs about $78 million a year 
in Cook County. Wow. Um, uh, and which, you know, obviously more than a, another way to look at it, more than a million dollars a week. And that's not even including um, police time. Uh, we think, I think it's like 1,400 police hours uh, a year as well are spent on this, just the booking process. And we didn't include policing in there be, in, the, in the total dollar tab because we've, we were trying to be really fair and figured uh, if they're not picking somebody up for cannabis, they might be out there policing something else like homicide. Sure, sure. Um, <laughs> But it takes a police officer, when they make an arrest for anything, it takes them minimum, each officer, about an hour and a half to go through the booking process and the paperwork. Most of the time they make an arrest, there are two officers involved. So you get a guy for even a small amount of marijuana. Um, they decide to take him back to the office. Two officers are off the street for an hour and a half minimum. And it's not just the, it's not just the money or the resources, but it's what happens to the people who are arrested and Absolutely. who is disproportionately, I they, assume, they get a They get a record. And, and essentially what happens in this town is unless you are um, really being, really showing off, walking down the street with police officers present, smoking a joint that's particularly redolent, like a great, you know, a great strain of weed or whatever, um, if you're white, you're not going to get arrested. And uh, if you're black, it's a whole different story. So essentially what we've realizes um, in a lot of ways marijuana is decriminalized for one segment of the population here but not for the other. So the way the numbers actually worked out, it's like 76% of the people arrested, 89% um, prosecuted, and 92% of the people jailed for marijuana possession are African American. So it's just off the charts and um, I probably don't have to tell most of you folks out here, usage rates are very comparable across communities and in fact are very, are what are you saying about my audience, Mick? <laughs> <laughs> so let's take a, a step back from both and talk about you personally. Why, what drives you? You've been doing this for years. The politics in the city never seems to get less crazy, never seems to get less corrupt. <laughs> what drives you to keep doing it? Do you ever think, you know what, I'm going to just start reviewing ballet. Yeah, we were talking about this on the way over here. I was like, geez, why didn't I become a sports reporter, you know? <laughs> interview people about whether or not their shots went down last night. Um, but then you'd get terrible but answers. You get tired of that, yeah, yeah. And, you know, whatever. It's, actually, I think, Everything's for the bad. record, I think sports, that's right. That's the way I see the world. Um, no, I think sports reporting, actually, entertainment reporting, in some ways, is more difficult because it's easy to do but harder to do well. Um, but why do I do this? I don't know. It's like a, it's a social ethics thing for me, I guess. It's, um, I, think it's, I think politics is the way that we... Uh, in our society, debate what is what is just and um, what is the path forward, and uh, what is how do our beliefs equate with our actions? And so, in my own little small way, um, I try to be part of that conversation. And do you get off the record from, let's take city councilmen? Do you get access to things that that you just think, man, that's the truth? I really wish I could get that out there, but I have obviously journalistic standards, I've made a promise, and, and you can't do anything with it. Yeah, there's like colorful details you come across, of course. I think every journalist does where it's not appropriate either because someone told you in a situation um, where it's just, it, it wasn't clearly on the record, or uh, you just make decisions where you're like, this is not fair to put this in public view. And so I'll just, you know, write in my journals, if I ever write a memoir, that's yeah. going in there, you know, that kind of thing. Um, what are a few of those examples? <laughs> <laughs> well, one thing I will say is uh, the standard is different if it's a polit an elected official versus just someone in the community I'm talking to. I mean, someone who says something potentially self-incriminating in, in, in a neighborhood or something who's not used to talking to the press, I'm not going to go run out there and just put it out there, you know, this guy, this uh, guy who stands on the corner dealing drugs tells me how it's done or whatever. It's like, you're not just, just going to put that out there because they're not used to talking to reporters. You have to think sure. about it. It's different if you're talking to an alderman behind city council chambers who forgets for a second you're a reporter just because they're so full of themselves and the sound of their own language. They just keep going on and on and on and on. And in that instance, I'm like, amen, brother. <laughs> <laughs> who, do you, who do you like? as a politician, whether, whether it's because you think their, their heart is in the right place or just because they crack you up? Well, you know, the truth is I actually like most of them. I mean, like, 
I don't have that much respect for the city council as a body because it doesn't really do anything except spend our money. Um, but uh, I like most of the aldermen. They're like most of them are characters and they're nice people. And so it's actually difficult sometimes to separate, um, you know, in interpersonal relationship with, with trying to hold them to account to do the jobs that we pay them $110,000 a year to do. Sure. Um, but politicians I like. Um, you know, I, I wrote a, a, a rather lengthy piece about Alderman Walter Burnett, who um, is not one of the most powerful figures in town, um, but is such a character, such a good, big-hearted guy, very frank about even uh, some of the sort of deal-making that he does day-to-day -day as an alderman. He's like Jesse White's disciple, does Jesse White's protege, and essentially is uh, protected by Jesse White politically, and is very candid about that, like, you know, and candid about voting down the line with the mayor. Absolutely. He's just like, well, what else am I supposed to do? I got I to gotta do this so that I can get the little goodies that I want to do and doesn't apologize for it. Um, there's, a, there's instances like that. I know uh, I'm supposed to, I was told by uh, one of Tony Preckwinkle's aides who's in the audience, I won't out him by name, but he said, remember, before I came up, remember, Tony Preckwinkle equals good. Tony <laughs> Preckwinkle equals good. I don't know, Tony's been on your show. I yeah. actually do have tremendous respect from Tony. I've um, written a few things recently, uh, kind of challenging her, taking her task on a few decisions around the election. Well, you but wrote, is she forming her own machine? Is she forming her own machine? She's like an independent reformer, but she um, essentially, like, you know, exiled a, one of her longtime loyal members of her organization for daring to say he didn't want to endorse a guy that she wanted to endorse. And... Um, so yeah, I, I wrote about that, but Did I also think- Did she exile him, or, or, or is that going too far? It's probably going too far, but come on, this is entertainment yeah. here. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's, I'm talking about All right, about let's, we'll politics. strike that from the record. It up a little bit. We'll keep you know, it back to exiled. Yeah, it was all about cocaine and sex, by the way. <laughs> um, no, it wasn't. Yeah. Uh, um, but uh, no, I, I do respect Tony Preckwinkle. Um, I, I, I think she's trying to navigate a place between building up political strength and actually trying to do something and you know got to give her credit first of all for the subject we were just talking about Ma reform to our marijuana laws she's one of the she few was elected so officials. high when she came on this show <laughs> <laughs> just floated up here yeah. on the stage <laughs> i mean you could just get a contact high yeah, it was amazing. Out. speaking of contact highs what is amazing um we've noticed the number of politicians who will make marijuana jokes like in in private settings you're on the elevator like Walter Burnett. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call him out on this Let's one. Let's do it. it actually makes, I think he'll, you'll appreciate this and it'll actually raise his esteem, but they just had a very serious press conference. He, he a couple other aldermen, um, Cook County Commissioner John Fritchie, who I know one of his aides is also in the audience, um, basically calling for Why changes. Why is every aide in the office, uh, in, I the, know. in the audience? We're the real people. Yeah. Come on, get out here, show your faces. This is great. No. Yeah, it is. You're, you're building up clout. The interview show clout. is, is developing I'm gonna clout. I'm going to form my own machine. <laughs> Maybe that'll help you get Denny. Be me, uh, Rhyme Fest. Yeah. <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> that was low. That was cheap. That was cheap. Our um, next guest uh, is a... What I was going to say is that after this very serious press yeah. conference where they called for reforms to marijuana law and talked about the disproportionate enforcement, we're in the elevator going downstairs, and Walter Burnett looks at a couple of us and goes, all right, guys, let's go in the alley and hit a fatty. <laughs> <laughs> I think he was kidding. I don't know. I mean, there's, whether he's kidding or not, there is so much hypocrisy around that issue. I, I heard a judge during a court case this last week involving people who've been jailed for uh, on a marijuana-related charge making contact high jokes on the bench. Wow. And so I'm just saying, it's like, on the one hand, people know that it's kind of ridiculous, you know, the, the way the system is set up, but yet it just goes on because people it's are It's just afraid. not worth it. It's just not worth it. It's just it not to worth them. it politically. And um, to me, it's like, start talking about marijuana. I think we could talk about cocaine, heroin, other drugs to various degrees, but marijuana is at the very bottom of the food chain. Marijuana possession, the lowest level charge for uh, a narcotic offense, and we still can't even have an honest conversation about that. That's disgraceful. Yeah. Well, what's, what's next? What, what's, uh, what are you working on now? 
some more stuff on pot. <laughs> <laughs> no, not just pot, but some stuff on uh, some stuff on violence, community violence, and um, looking at. I mean, we just had again this flare up of violence. The police chief has declared war on gangs, and my question to the police chief is, why are the gangs warring with each other? It's not just because they have different names. They're warring over money, and they're warring over money that comes through the drug trade. So, folks out there, all I ask, pay attention to uh, not just what they're saying, but what they're not saying, because uh, that you know this is all politics. It's easier to say I'm declaring war on gangs than to actually do something to change the situation. Well, Mick, thanks for coming. Thanks a lot for having me Mick on. Mick Dumpke from the Chicago Reader.